Welcome back to At Home with the Dogginses. Hello, everyone. And Allie thought it might be fun to talk about video games. Yes, and this is uh, due to the fact that it's now officially been three weeks since I managed to get a Switch for under $300. Yes. A Switch Lite, to be precise. Uh, yeah, yeah. Trying to find an actual Switch out here is like dang near impossible, so I settled on the Lite, and I've been really pleased with my choice. I have borrowed it mostly to play old video games. <laughs> um, and since seeing that we've been fondly calling this thing the Game Boy, I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about our relationship with uh, video games and uh, stuff that made us happen when we were kids. So, uh, baby, why don't you tell me about your uh, relationship with video games? Well, since there aren't enough uh, white men talking about video games on the internet (laughs) just yet, I've discussed it in videos before that I've never been much of a gamer in part because we did not own any consoles growing up Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i would play video games at friends houses sometimes um but our parents refused to buy us any Mm -hmm. video game systems uh we had computers so we played computer games Mm -hmm. some of those computer games were old video games like tetris or Mm -hmm. When we first got our first CD-ROM computer that had Windows and not just DOS and had an actual color (laughs) monitor and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was a very big deal for us, even though this was like 1996 when this happened. (laughs) We got the computer from my mom's sister, who was uh, getting rid of it. And uh, a lot of the games they had came with the uh, computer. Uh, They gave us a lot of the games they had. One of which was a collection of uh, games Activision had made for the Atari back in the day. Oh, wow. So this was like, you know, Pitfall and Hero and Mm -hmm. uh, these old ancient video games that uh, we just played with a computer keyboard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This collection was one of those, you know nostalgia bait collections where it's like of course of course you know now on cd-rom all you late 70s early 80 kids here's all the games you grew up with Mm -hmm. so there was actually a mode with this collection where you could set it for pure nostalgia uh you could set it so that every like 20 minutes the voice of your cranky mother yells at you about not doing homework that's awesome (laughs) uh (laughs) So those were technically video games, but we played them on the computer. The other games our aunt gave us with the computer, uh, Math Blaster Mystery, which is a particularly weird entry in the Math Blaster Mm -hmm. uh, saga, which had nothing to do with the other Math Blaster games other than vaguely involving an alien character and math problems. But it was basically just walking around a haunted house solving Mm -hmm. math problems. Mm -hmm. It was an odd one. Uh... Also, where in the USA is Carmen San Diego? Mm-hmm. Um, I was a big Carmen San Diego fan already, so it was fun to own that. Uh, but the real life changing thing that came with this gift was the King's Quest collection. Ah, there we go. There's your root. Yes. Uh, this was the 15th anniversary King's Quest collection, which had King's Quest 1 through 6, plus the King's Quest 1 remake. A game called King's Questions, which was a King's Quest trivia game. Mm-hmm. A game called Nick's Picks for some reason, which I I, I think was... When did your brother get a video game? <laughs> I asked the same question. <laughs> but when you clicked on it, it said, like, Crazy Nick's Software Picks. So I think that was, like, the collection that it was part of. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just backgammon and checkers that you played against King Graham. Mm-hmm. But it was just backgammon and checkers. Okay. Um. And then also a bunch of, like, bonus video clips, uh, including a preview for King's Quest Seven, which was already well out probably by the time we got this. Uh, if it wasn't out yet, it was very close to being out. But this was a just preview for King's Quest Seven uh, as part of this collection. Not a playable demo, just a video Mm-hmm. preview of course, of course about like now they're working on king's quest 7 and like <laughs> behind the scenes clips and that sort of thing i've spoken elsewhere in videos about how much that particular uh, thing changed my life but beyond that yeah we didn't mm-hmm. own any consoles so we were mostly just playing video games at friends houses mm-hmm. uh so we never got very far in any video games uh i played whatever mario game any given friend had i would play a lot and 
Mario's pretty easy to jump into. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you're playing on someone else's saved games, most of, most of the Mario games, like I have a lot of nostalgia for Super Mario World for SNES just from playing it at other people's houses and jumping on their saved games, so getting to play mm. further along than uh, I would otherwise in the time. My experience with Zelda games is pretty minimal, uh, mm-hmm. but I played Ocarina of Time, again, on other friends' saved games, so I could actually do things that I wouldn't have gotten to do had I just been starting from the beginning mm-hmm. at the time. And then I'd uh, play games on my friends' Game Boys and stuff, Um Mario 64, another big one, of course. Mm, oh, yeah. And then at one point, uh, for a while, I had a Final Fantasy VII saved game mm-hmm. at my friend Eric's house. Uh, uh, my best friend Eric, on his PlayStation, I had a Final Fantasy VII save game. I don't remember how far I got on it. I just remember for a couple months, every time I come over there, I'd get a little farther. And Eric was really pushing Final Fantasy VII on me. He was like, this is the... F- <laughs> <laughs> this is the first video game that has ever made me cry. Oh, oh my gosh. Which, you know, is probably true for a lot of people, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did not get to any of the real emotional parts. I probably logged like five or six hours of total gameplay in Final Fantasy VII, which yeah. is not really enough to get super far. Mm-hmm. But he also loaned me the soundtrack, which I ripped to my computer. So the soundtrack for Final Fantasy VII shows up in a lot of my old videos. That makes perfect sense, though. Yeah, you, you can, uh, as we've been relitigating the old craft, if you've been rewatching along with us, you might recognize quite a few Final Fantasy VII tunes in some of the other videos. So yeah, my relationship with video games is that I would generally play them at other people's houses. Some friends would get annoyed with me because... I would come over and just play the video games and they'd want to do anything else. And I'd be like, you don't understand. I mm-hmm. can't do this at home. No, of course, of course. And like our across the street neighbors had an N64. They had Diddy Kong Racing mm-hmm. and uh, GoldenEye, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was less into GoldenEye because first person shooters were less interesting to me than cartoony worlds mm-hmm. were. Oh, of course, yeah. And I definitely played Star Fox there too, but I can't remember if they owned it or if they just rented it and then other friends owned it. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. But then later in life, I would download emulators and play emulated versions of all the old console games I grew up playing at other people's houses so I could actually play them for once. So I'd download an emulator and play uh, Super Mario World and get a lot farther, but also playing that on the keyboard is... A very different experience than playing it on a game controller. Yeah, of course. I also played on that same emulator. I played Mario RPG, but I didn't beat Super Mario RPG until college when my roommate, uh, one of my roommates brought his SNES in Mm -hmm. and I had a save game on that. So when I eventually beat Super Mario RPG, it was on the system it was intended to be beat Mm -hmm. on. It was just years after the fact. Of course, of course. But yeah, so on your Switch Lite, I've mostly been, once again, playing Super Mario World, because I think it is my favorite of the Mario entire saga, Mm -hmm. as well as Yoshi's Island I've been playing. Dr. Mario quite a bit. Dr. Mario I've spent a lot of time on. Dr. Mario is easier, because that's more in the Tetris vein of, Mm -hmm. like, I am not committing to trying to actually explore the world i'm just here solve the puzzle that is immediately in front of you Mm -hmm. super mario world replaying it i love it there are some levels that are very stressful and at least with dr mario when i lose i lose and i don't tell myself i have to keep doing it until i beat the level yeah there are times when um when uh because sometimes we we, uh act like we are a web comic from 2003 where i will be you know we'll be lying down and he'll be on my switch and i'll just be kind of like gazing at him lovingly as he plays but he'll just tense up when it gets to certain parts of the game it's like no 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 playing a video game with my adoring girlfriend yes fiance but wouldn't have been fiance in the web comic yeah (laughs) But it's fun to have access to all the old video games on your new top-of-the-line video game system. Oh, yeah. I have not played anything made this decade or even last decade yet on your Switch. I've only played things made in the 80s and 90s. True, though I am planning on getting Paper Mario when that comes out for Switch in a couple of weeks, so I fully expect the, to you to give it a whirl to let me know how that rolls out. Well, and eventually we're going to get um, 
uh, Mario Odyssey. That's the Switch one, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should know these things, but I'm a fake geek boy. You're cute, though. You just keep me around for the eye candy. Mm. And such candy it is. <laughs> So what have you mostly been playing on the Switch that you purchased with your money yes. that I just borrow sometimes <laughs> when I'm procrastinating yeah. on editing this very podcast? Yeah. So um, my particular uh, play uh, style of video game play that I like are more kind of like open world, some story involved, but you kind of get a really chance to play around. So sandbox games are really big. Uh, thing for me uh the number one game because i just checked to see how many hours i've logged into it so far i have done about 75 hours on stardew valley at this point (laughs) which is like it makes sense but seems fake uh (laughs) um so i've been playing a lot of stardew valley um i was a big fan of harvest moon when when i was a kid uh we i got a game boy along with my sister and uh, she got all the pokemon games and i got um Harvest Moon and uh, Harvest Moon. Uh, so a lot of the kind of the more open world farming games and she got all the Pokemon, which I was fine with because I didn't really care about Pokemon too much as a kid or to be completely honest as an adult now. Uh, so I really kind of love these open worlds and I am also a major addicted to Sims person as Dave can attest. Like mm-hmm. I watch tons of videos on mods. I used to do my own modifications back like when I was a kid on uh, Sims 2, but I never liked the modding community online because I always managed to find the creepy weird dudes on there. And when you're nine and somebody's asking for you to talk on uh, aim chat for a long period of time when you're nine, it's like, no, no, sir, not down for this. Oh, God. Uh, so I did not... Uh, really kind of progressed in my modding career from that, though, looking back, I probably could have a YouTube channel that's got probably a few million people watching, and if I had bothered to stay with it. We all could have been in a different place had we made smarter YouTube decisions in 2006. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So what I've mostly been kind of wanting to play for a long time was Stardew Valley. I had gotten it on uh, Steam, but it's not worked on my laptop very well so but everyone i've talked to says it really works well on uh switch so got that for it and i've been obsessed with the gameplay on there the one thing i've been wanting to get but i've been scared to purchase is animal crossing because i know for a fact that the second i get animal crossing you are never going to see me again I'm going to be gone because I'm going to be making my little island look as perfect as possible because start because it's a uh, Animal Crossing seems like the cross between what I love about The Sims, which is building and making stuff, and what I kind of love about Stardew Valley, which the store the which the storytelling and you know getting to make friends. So I just would no longer exist if I got my hands on Animal Crossing. But I've also been playing a game called Coffee Talk, where you are a barista in an alternative version of Seattle, <laughs> and you get to listen to people's problems and you make them coffee based on their emotional state. Um, I've also been playing Aviary Attorney, where you get to play a horny bird lawyer in the 1840s. And you it's a very Phoenix Wright ace, ace attorney, but everyone are, are horny birds. And but, but like filtered through one of those weird dating sims, like in, y- in tone. <laughs> it, it's like, no, well, this one is like, it's very, it's, it's very Ace Attorney. So you got to find the clues to solve the murder, but it's all like. I, I just mean in terms of like sense of humor. Oh, yeah, like, to- totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It got a very Dream Daddy sensibility to, to that one. Dream Daddy is another game that I would like to have on Switch if possible. Um, and another game I have not downloaded yet, but I want to is Untitled Goose Game. Because I loved playing it on Steam, but I really want to play it on uh, Switch because I need something a little bit more open world. And I really want to be a horrible goose when I grow up. I purposely avoided video games for a good, like, 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, Because I know how much of a time suck it is for me. Like, I tend to get very focused on, like, one activity. And video games is something that's always very time sucky for me. Oh, back in, like... 2004 2005 like towards the end of my high school years beginning of my college years i made a point of not allowing myself to even try one minute of world of warcraft because i knew it would destroy my life i knew what an addictive obsessive and compulsive personality i have i knew that I would not do anything else. The worst decision my history teacher gave us is that as a reward, you could play an hour of civilization. And I I, I was dead. <laughs> I 
do not know how I got through anything because he would just let me play Civ on the computer in history class. I do not know how I passed history because I was too busy trying to get to God mode Gandhi level so that I could start killing everybody because, you know, when I figured out that once you hit uh, a certain thing, Gandhi becomes like the biggest genocidal dictator fuckhead. <laughs> and I was always excited when I could make that happen. So <laughs> uh, best and worst mistake I ever made was like getting hooked in on uh, Civ 5. <laughs> no, I- Civ 4 back in the day. Yeah, Civ 4. There are other uh, computer games I had gotten into at various points, some of which were actual games made for computers, some of which were the PC version of video games that, like, they were being ported to both computer and consoles at the same time. Yeah, yeah, And some of them could probably, uh, we could do entire topics on. Like, some of them we could probably do entire podcasts on. Some of them... I want to do some sort of video on eventually. Mm -hmm. For instance, my brother and I were really into the Phantom Menace game when that came out. You'd mentioned this. For obvious reasons. And we've been wanting to do a Let's Play or something of it for a while. Like something where we get to just play through the game again and just riff on it, just make fun of it. Mm -hmm. We've been wanting to do this for years. We still have the CD of the game. The problem is getting a computer rigged up that the game still works on, but that is also powerful enough to record the game at the same time. Because I can get the game working on my MacBook through uh, Crossover, but then when I try to do uh, OBS or Screen Flick or anything to capture the footage, it just slows way the fuck down to an unwatchable state. And meanwhile, Nick's PC, which he's able to screen capture on pretty well, won't run the game Mm -hmm. so eventually we're going to rig up something to be able to do something with this phantom menace game because Mm -hmm. we love it 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 is both much better than a phantom menace game has any right to be and also much worse than any big hyped star wars game should be because there are parts that are really detailed and you can explore whole worlds and then there are parts that are just clearly unfinished. And if you try to jump on a certain rooftop, like you just fall through the roof and die. <laughs> that is delightful. It's kind of amazing. It's also like it came out in this awkward LucasArts time where it's like after Escape from Monkey Island and Grim Fandango. And it's like they weren't really doing adventure games anymore. But mm-hmm. it's, it has some of the mechanics of an adventure game, but not really. It's mm-hmm. it's, it's very weird. Wild. Other games we had included uh, Lego Island we logged a lot of hours on. I feel like my brothers really were into Lego Island. I kind of was getting off, slightly off the video game tip like when they got really into Lego Island. So Lego Island was kind of that like world exploration thing, but it was also like you had very specific finite goals in it. Mm-hmm. And the thing that always disappointed me about Lego Island is like anytime you can build a vehicle in it, you always had to... Like they say, you can build a vehicle any way you want, but really that just meant you can change the colors and the stickers on the vehicle. Yeah. It had to be a car-shaped car. You couldn't really... Like, I was hoping it could be like, as long as it has the wheels and the motor, anything else can go crazy, but it wasn't like that. But it had, like, fun stuff to explore. It it it, it had elements of that open world thing that mm-hmm. that you, you like so much, and I, that I like too, like... When I get into a video game, it's for the same reason I love a really well-themed theme park land. Mm -hmm. It's like, I like feeling like this world is real. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like the same thing I love about Ghost Town Alive, where it's like, oh, now I feel like Calico is actually lived in. Yeah. I like a video game that makes me feel like I could explore this whole world, even Mm -hmm. if I can really only explore a very finite part of it. Yeah, I love that feeling of like having some kind of control, but it's... Uh, but knowing the fact that it's still control within the uh, bound to the gameplay mechanics, basically. Exactly. So Lego Island was a big one for us. We also had the Toy Story 2 video game on our computer, mm. which I know was also cross border to like N64 and probably PlayStation. We played it on N64 once at a friend's house, and it looked way better on the computer. Mm-hmm. Way better, which is to say it still looked like 1999 graphics and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... It looked even worse on N64 than it looked on the computer. Mm -hmm. And the Toy Story 2 one was interesting because it was like the levels were kind of like worlds from the movie, but it wasn't like get to the end of the level. It was just like, 
hey, here's like five tasks you can do in the level. And if you do enough of them, you pass the level. Mm -hmm. So it's like ostensibly the first level is about getting out of Andy's house, but you don't really get out of it. You just collect the things and then you move on. Yeah. But it was also like it seemed like the environments were pretty much it seems like they just went to Pixar and got the sets that Pixar built for the movie, like the digital assets, and just Mm -hmm. imported them wholesale. Because, like, the level where you're exploring Al's apartment was pretty elaborate Mm -hmm. and pretty screen accurate. Mm -hmm. So I have not played that game in 20 years, so I'm sure some parts of it are better than I remember and some parts are worse than I remember. The thing, though, it was this very rigid format where it's like every three levels, then there's a boss fight. Mm -hmm. And the first boss fight was like a slime monster who had nothing to do with anything. You know how video games based on movies will throw in random villains like that just for padding for a video game format. So, like, I'm pretty sure it was the first boss in this game was like this green slime monster that comes out of a trash can that you have to defeat. Yeah, of course. And it's weird. It's weird. Like, then later on, bosses are like Zerg and... Stinky Pete, you know, <laughs> vi- villains actually in the movie. Yeah. But nope, not there. Another similarly weird game that was mostly about collecting things that was not based on a specific movie, but was based on a franchise was Bugs Bunny Lost in Time. Mm-hmm. Now, this was a game I liked a lot about, even though it had some very frustrating, like cheap ass license game elements. Mm-hmm. Basically, you were Bugs Bunny and there are different worlds based on different time periods and each time period kind of has one Bugs Bunny villain as like its focal Mm -hmm. villain. So like caveman times is all about Elmer Fudd pirate times is all about Yosemite Sam. At one point you go to the thirties, which is of course uh, Rocky and Muggsy, the gangster characters. Uh, Okay. And then uh, you go into the future where it's all Marvin the Martian. Mm -hmm. But what was fun was that a lot of the sequences in the game were sort of based on specific Looney Tunes cartoons, based on classic iconic Looney Tunes moments. And there were some fun ways where they kind of try to gamify cartoon gags, Mm -hmm. which sometimes did not work. And it's just like, oh, you're taking this fun, whimsical thing and just making it clinical. But sometimes it was actually kind of fun. So, like, there was this one bonus level that was basically based on the wabbit season, duck season gag. Mm -hmm. And it's basically just within the time frame, you and Daffy are both running around and you're changing all the signs to, say, duck season. Like, like Mm -hmm. you're changing all the signs to the duck picture instead of the wabbit picture. Mm -hmm. And basically at the end of the level... If more of the signs say duck season than wabbit season, you mm-hmm. win. And if mm-hmm. more of the signs say wabbit season, you lose. And I believe they included in the gag where you could change a sign. Like Daffy would be following you changing the signs back. Mm-hmm. I believe they included an element where if you change a sign that said duck season already to say wabbit season, then Daffy changes it to duck season. Mm-hmm. Basically adding that element of the gag to Uh, the game. Ah, nice, nice. Which was very entertaining for a Looney Tunes fanboy. Overall, the game was mediocre, but it had nice little touches like that that I appreciated. Nice, nice. And then at one point, we got King's Quest VIII Mask of Eternity, which is just... Less of the better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll say things about it someday, but Mm -hmm. uh, this is neither the time nor place. Yeah. I've sort of monopolized the conversation for the past 10 minutes. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. Um, but yeah, so hey, we'll bring it out to the uh, to the listeners. Uh, what game should I take a look at for this Switch? Because I, as uh, Dave can attest, can get very uh, bored easily. So I love uh, looking for new things. Uh, if you have a Switch recommendation, a you know PC game recommendation or a Steam recommendation, I'd love to take you up on that and uh, find some new things to play around with. Yes, uh, it's possible by the time you're hearing this, we've already acquired some new games. and uh, we'll- I may, Yeah, I may have actually gotten Animal Crossing at this point and have turned into a puff of KK Banster smoke at this point. Yes, we'll probably talk more about games we're playing or games we have played or mm-hmm. games we will play. Games from my childhood I forgot about. And again, we might do full episode expansions or I might do full videos or something on some of these other games. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if we do end up getting like a full switch, we'll talk about like the new gaming options with that when compared to with the light. So, yes, exactly. I'm not a gamer, but I know what I like.
I am also not a gamer, but uh, I know what makes me laugh, so hey. I'm not a gamer, but I play one on podcast. <laughs> anyway, I think that wraps things up for this episode of At Home with the Dogginses. Especially since I need to put my thing on the charger soon, so. <laughs> You've actually been playing Switch while we've been talking about this. <laughs> eh, you know, I'm uh, good at multitasking, what can I say? <laughs> All right, we will see you next time, folks. Later days, y'all. Later days. Later days.